The terrorist attack in Christchurch, New Zealand against two mosques by a white supremacist uh, is really, it, it's such a huge tragedy. 50 people have been killed, uh, tens of people have been injured, and of course, uh, you know, reading about and seeing footage of the act, you can see how callously uh, this, this uh, man mows down uh, believers who are going about their business, praying in a mosque, yeah, and, and as if like it's a video game. Young, young people, uh, children, uh, old doesn't men, matter. it doesn't matter. And actually when you, when you see how that's, that's been carried out, it's exactly the same as ISIS, the way you know, they uh, execute a whole large group of people with no sense of, you know, there's a human being there that you are destroying here. And that's a result of the fact that they have been uttered, they've been alienated, they've been sort of se separated in the mind, it's just, they're not human beings anymore. I mean, that's what it is. Yeah. And I, again, this is something that we've talked about a lot, is the similarities between the Islamist movement and this white supremacist mm -hmm. movement. And sometimes people find that absurd because, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot more power that the Islamists have and so they can't see the level of violence that the white supremacists can meet out and, and of course we've seen it in Nazi Germany and in other periods as well but the similarities are really interesting both movements uh, talk about a golden age you know the Islamists want the Khalifa and of course the white supremacists are dreaming of a time when uh, there were no brown or black people uh, according to them uh, their, their reliance on misogyny homophobia anti-semitism uh, you know, their attempts to terrorize uh, and dehumanize anyone who they're against. The Islamists, it's the Kuffar, and for the white supremacists, it's the refugees, the migrants. Yeah, and, and, and I think you could see that the narrative of the anti-refugee and uh, anti-migrant on one hand, on the other hand, the, uh, the Western, uh, uh, you know, countries coming on, destabilizing, undermining the whole ethos of the Islamic sort of society, supposedly. Uh, those two narratives uh, um, completely is the dominant uh, language, the, uh, the, the dominant form of discourse in uh, European countries, uh, in Western con countries. On the other hand, the, the language of the Islamists is the language of the dominant Islamists in, in government as well in, in, in Middle East and North Africa. Uh, you know, anti-immigration. It's a normal policy of the Australian government and the UK government. Look at the Trump, the way he treats sort of Mexican and foreigners and, you know, Muslim ban uh, on one hand. Uh, and you see how uh, the Islamists in, uh, in Middle East, uh, they treat the foreigners. Uh, and, and the Kuffar. And, and the Kuffar, yeah. exactly. What's also interesting is you can see they both have international links. You know, the Islamists, uh, they'll put a bomb somewhere and say it's because of Palestine. They've never even been there. Uh, you, and you have this uh, white supremacist talking about things that have taken place in, in Britain and in other European countries. You know, this sense that uh, it is part of an international movement, I think that's really key. The network. Uh, it's, it's and that's why it has to be dealt with internationally. Mm. It's not something you can deal with only within national boundaries. And also the other thing is this whole idea of collective blame, you know, the Islamists will blame all the kuffar, you know, if the US, for example, drops a bomb in uh, Iraq, well, they think it's fair game to uh, bomb a discotheque or a bus. And in the same way, this uh, man is upset about something or, or he feigns to be upset about something and he thinks it's perfectly fine to mow down believers in a mosque in a completely different country. And again, this idea of placing collective blame, everyone who is the other is responsible. And it's, a, it's really an act of revenge rather than any real, uh, uh, you know, um, desire for justice, which would not involve massacring innocent people. Yeah, and, and that's, that's the similarity. Every aspect of the right-wing supremacist uh, ideology, method, thinking, argument, you could see exactly the same in the, for the Islamist, right-wing Islamists uh, that have been terrorizing uh, everywhere. I mean, there is not a day that could you know, it's passed without the atrocities committed by the Islamists on exactly the same, the same method. But I come back again to the fact that the environment created for these actions are responsibility of the politicians, the mainstream political parties uh, uh, in Europe. And uh, you've seen the senator in Australia immediately after uh, the 
the massacre in, uh, in Christchurch, um, he comes up to look the fault of the immigration. And uh, it's unbelievable. And then, unbelievable. of course, you've got Australia's policies in Nauru, in, uh, mm. in different islands where they have uh, relegated uh, refugees to really uh, slave-like conditions and inhuman conditions. Yeah. So the, the, the links can be quite clearly seen. Um, but again, now there's there's some people that will blame people like ourselves as being uh, uh, contributing to uh, this climate because they say with our criticism of Islam, of Islamism, we're contributing to a climate that uh, um, perpetrates hate against Muslims. And I think, again, these are very separate things because, uh, you know, we're defending the right to be free from religion, the right to criticize religion. That's not the same as white supremacism. That's a very different thing, you know. And also, uh, we're doing it whilst respecting the right to religion, whilst respecting uh, human rights, secularism, universalism, uh, not treating people as, you know, subhuman, but saying we're all equal, but we also have the right to equality and to criticize religion. The white supremacists and the Islamists are they completely different. They won't recognize so any of So there's no this. comparison. But it's interesting, uh, while, uh, you know, the world is facing two poles of sort of right-wing uh, uh, group and ideology, which is exactly the roots of the, the same, the Islamists and the supremacists, the human sort of uh, element of people's sort of desire to be free from these, it shines out very clearly in the argument you've just uh, uh, made. And uh, you, you could see the Prime Minister of New Zealand comes and shows her empathy and, and support for uh, people who have suffered. And he, she goes and hugs them. I could see the feeling and I think that reflected quite a lot and people sort of uh, uh, associated with that. But at the same time, rightly to organize uh, to criticize uh, uh, to say look of course we have to de uh, uh, declare an empathy and, uh, and and solidarity but we have to be careful not to not to use the symbols of oppression of from the other side uh, to be able to express yourself you don't have to bear a job to be able to express your humanity as a human being you can do that as like many other people have done you don't have to take Quran and start reciting Quran in, in Parliament to be able to express your, you know, your emotions, your, uh, your feeling of hurt and solidar solidarity and taking action to remove the, the condition as well. I think that's very important to, to recognize is we don't have to succumb to the other side sort of reactionary element. Definitely, and I think it, it is important because following uh, what she did, you know, there's now a call in Australia on the 22nd of March for women to go and wear the hijab in solidarity with uh, Muslims in that country and again in New Zealand and again uh, you know that is uh, that will encourage the Islamist movement uh, because don't forget you're not just dealing with white supremacy and I think this is one of the problems people are either against Islamists or they're against white supremacists and the far right they don't see how these are linked and they have to be careful in any uh, thing that we do that we fight them both and we don't encourage one versus the other you know yeah. and that's exactly what happens when you defend the veil when you defend uh, you know uh, religion um, rather than just saying look defending human beings and citizenship and, and, and she did that so beautifully before she even wore the veil yeah you know? absolutely and he doesn't need he doesn't need any precondition but uh, Usually, the, after every atrocity, after every bombing, you'll see the different right-wing groups come and try to push the agenda. Now, Muslim of Council of Britain, it's uh, uh, asking for additional funds for not only for security, for other activities as well. Islamists actually are uh, carrying on, led by uh, people like Muslim Council of uh, organization, like Muslim Council of uh, Britain, to ban teaching of the uh, tolerance of homosexuality and understanding uh, uh, homosexuality. Um, then from, schools. Know, from schools, exactly. Uh, on the other hand, the right-wing nationalists, they, they're using this opportunity to advance the anti-immigration and anti-foreign uh, agenda, uh, and which is uh, encapsulated in sort of Brexit, Trump, all of those, and they're trying to push that. And we need to be able to stand very clearly firm against these two poles of effectively terrorism. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in, they're not, now they are international uh, organizations and network, and we need to uh, be able to defend humanity and there's no if, there's no but, there's no precondition on all sides and I think that's important to, to recognize.